Hello, um, welcome everyone to the third chapter of the webinar series of the International Network of Science, Religion and Health. I am Rafael Casarin, a social scientist based at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I'm the coordinator of the network and together with Margriera, network director, we organize the seminar series. This network is funded by the International Network for the Study of Science and Belief in Society. Our aim with this network is to foster collaborations, knowledge exchange, and training for researchers working on social and cultural narratives on science, religion, spirituality, and health. And today we're very excited uh, to have one more member of the network. We've got here Dr. Rodrigo Toniol, Associate Professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Rodrigo is also a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Um, I'll leave this screen to our presenter, to Rodrigo, but first, I would just like to make sure that um, you all um, mute your microphones. And if you've got any questions, we're gonna open the floor uh, after the presentation and you can also write on the chat, okay? So thank you everyone for coming and Rodrigo, the screen is yours. Well, thank you, Rafael. Thank you, Mar, for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. I, I'm very excited also. So I, I actually, I, I have prepared my talk as a kickoff of a conversation. So that's my, my main idea. I, I would like to put some ideas and let's talk about that after. So the seminar that I, I'm going to present here is part of a major research program called uh, capturing spirituality. Uh, and I, I carry out of this, this research on the last years, uh, the last five years, actually. And it was a very big project. I just published the Portuguese book uh, called Espiritualidade Incorporada. And I also launched a book uh, with the, the, the final version of this research in Spanish, and it's it's free download. So I'm gonna send to Rafael the link, so everyone can download the book and discuss uh, through the paper. So let me give you some general information before properly start uh, about the research. So the, the research project is dedicated to analyze the ways of the category spirituality has been enacted on the medical sciences. So that's my point. It's Im very important to highlight here, uh, and I will insist on that after all, that I'm not talking about uh, marginal process, alternative therapies and that stuff, but at least not in, in this, this step. Uh, uh, we are talking about the mainstream. And I'm trying to understand in this project, uh, how the category of spirituality works on the mainstream level of the medical field. But before to show, uh, before I speak properly about my, my project, my research, I'd like to show you a very special video. So I'm going to stop to uh, the, the presentation right now and change actually the one moment are you seeing the the youtube yeah yes okay so it's a very short video at the flick of a switch Laboratory, we have reproduced every aspect of the God experience, every essence, every component of it, from the rising sensation to the feelings of ecstasy to the feelings of a sensed presence to the feelings that you're at one with the universe. We can do that experimentally. Professor Persinger has gone straight to the source of creativity, emotion, and fantasy by stimulating this area, the temporal lobes and the limbic system with complex magnetic fields that set up electrical charges in the brain. In our presence, one subject had a near-death experience. A sudden wave of darkness. 
it's a distant point of light. There are two people who responded in exactly the same way. But all of them come out of this chamber with a profound sense that something hugely significant has taken place. This sound chamber that doesn't allow anything from the outside to come inside. Now I start hearing voices. I start seeing things. Started with faces. There was a lot of faces, but distorted faces, moving kind of almost like seeing something through heat. I felt a presence behind me, like kind of staring down at me, and it seemed very strange. This presence was, it wasn't, it wasn't frightening at all. It was very comforting, actually. It was like dreaming, but I was awake. Just like when you have a dream, sometimes you wake up and your dreams are just so, it was so real. I saw bright lights and I heard voices. Was that God speaking? What, or was that Professor Person who just flipping a few switches? What we have found is that individuals who show a temporal lobe sensitivity or creativity and who are very religious, in that setting, they will have a religious experience. We can generate the sense of presence, which is defined as God. I think. So. Back to my presentation. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, follow my text here. So scientists have a very long history of speculation about the tie between religions, feelings, and the human mind, or in a more naturalistic way, the brain. In the 80s, the neuroscientist Michael Persinger attempted to, I quote, create religious feelings by produce, producing electromagnetic fields on the brain. The researchers, I quote again, induce in most of them the experience of a sensitive presence, a feeling that someone or a spirit is, the, is in the room when no one is, or a profound state of cosmic bliss that reveals a universal truth. Thus, Persinger argues that religion experience and belief in God are merely the results of electro electrical anomalies in the human brain. He suggests that even in most even the most exalted religious figures, such as St. Paul, Muhammad, and Buddha, steam from such neuro quirks. The God, the helmet of God, is in principle a way to enact a God on you or to enact your brain as God. So, uh, after the 70s, and the, this kind of scientific experiment became very popular and improved a new gender, uh, literature gender, the neurotheology. It's a mix of literature, scientific literature, self-help, and theology. Unfortunately, I have to say my research is not about God helmet or neurotheology, at least not yet. But in, in some way, uh, it is related to this general movement. Uh, and through these examples, I would like to introduce you, you by contracts, my own field work. My research is about the uses, appropriations, and repercussions of the category spirituality in the medical field. Empirically, if we consider the God helmet experience, there are two main differences with what I'm following. And the first very important difference here is we are talking, I'm talking about uh, the academic mainstream, very official health agents, such as the World Health Organization. I did field work there uh, that say something about religion and spirituality. The, the second point, very important here, is that while the God helmet aimed to enact the spiritual experience, I'm trying to track the, not the ways to enact the spiritual experience, but how medical sciences enact the spirituality as a health issue. So this is very important here. So my point is how the spirituality became a very a medical topic and how it became important. 
In 2016, I started a research project interested in how spirituality has been enacted in the medical field. The research was about the ways of this category uh, circulates, mobilize, and are used in contexts such as medical research groups, public policies, and clinical situations. Again, it's important to highlight here that I'm not talking about marginal process or alternative therapies. I'm trying to understand how this category works on the mainstream level. To be brief, uh, the phenomenon of spirituality turning into a medical topic is articulated by a creation of research programs about that. So when I started this research, I was very wondering if it was, I mean, something very Brazilian or something very particular. But I start to find this kind of initiatives in various universities, such as Harvard, Columbia, Yale, and a lot different universities. And the, the topic was spirituality and health. And then I start to, the, to research the uh, tie between spirituality and health on the med line. I mean, on the medical journals. And this is the graphic. This is very, I mean, this, this is a, a good argument. How spirituality became a very popular topic also for the medical uh, laboratories and, and researchers. This is very impressive. On the book, I compare with different um, diagnoses and, and, and medical issues. And spirituality is like some something very special that grew on the, the last dec decades. So, uh, if you read those articles, you will find some positive correlations between uh, spirituality and health. As one can presume, medical researchers needed to employ instruments and methodologies capable of converting spirituality into a scientific data to establish such correlations. That is to say, they must transform it into some observable, recordable, and comparable indicators. In this sense, medical research not merely describes the correlation between spirituality and health, but works, and this is very important for me, works to transform the abstract idea of spirituality into an object of a concrete reality. The methodologies of medical science engage in evaluating spirituality, not only describe it in a clinical language, but largely establish it as an ontological reality. So, and this is, uh, I would like to highlight it here also. The methodologies of the, those medical researchers have changed a lot in the last decades. So when we start to do the research, I went to the laboratories. I will talk about that after. Uh, and I, I find different methodologies and, and I try to figure out how it changed, they, how the changes on the methodologies also changed the idea of spirituality on the medical field. In the 70s, spirituality was mainly a topic in the field of psychology on the medical uh, stuff. In that context, this was described as a particular individual dimension, but especially on the 90s, the research about the subject changed and neuroscientists start to explain the biological correspondence between spirituality and the brain. I don't have too much time here to describe the whole process, but the essential point uh, to highlight is that the transformation of the ways to enact spirituality inscribed it in, into a natural or biological perspective on the brain. This change allows me to present my uh, argument that the recognition of spirituality as a, as a medical topic is also a process of a process that universalizes spirituality. 
In other words, spirituality as a question of health is not related to a particular subjectivities, but to a human dimension inscribed on the body. To do so, I uh, to do the research, I would like to highlight, uh, to, to point out the three main axes of my research program. Uh, the first one is about the medical scientists in Brazil and Europe analyzing the correl correlation between spirituality or more spirituality and a healthiest life. They are doing research and the conclusions are something like if you are more spiritualized, you have less chance to get of getting a heart attack. That that's very uh, usual conclusion for for them. So I'm I, I was researching the researchers. I was doing uh, lab field work, um, ethnography of labs. I'm following some medical research groups trying to figure out the relations between more spirituality or less spirituality and more health or less health. As you can see here, um, it covers many medical topics related to spirituality and health. So I just put here three articles. So they, they produce correlations between spirituality and men with prostate cancer, spirituality and pain, spirituality and autonomic cardiac control. So it's a, a very wide uh, perspective about the impacts of spirituality. So to produce this kind of relation saying that you if you are more spiritualized, you have less chance, you have less chance of getting a heart attack, you need to measure spirituality. And that was my 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 field work, how they measure spirituality actually. And my my whole point here is how medical how those medical researchers enact the reality of spirituality measuring it producing a concrete reality of it they they do that through different kinds of devices technologies and instruments taking the perspective of latour big works and the debates about material religion it's easy to recognize how those technologies capture it capture the spirituality is related also to how spirituality is enacted as a real entity in the medical field. So spirituality can be materialized as a subject manifestation, for example, with this kind of sur surveys that measure oh. Well, so the point is, uh, different methodologies, they enact the spirituality in different ways. We have uh, a first phase of uh, methodologies from the psychology trying to measure spirituality through surveys. Uh, and this was until the 80s, actually. But... Uh, after after the 90s, a more nat natural reality printed on the brain structure appears to be a more convincing uh, perspective about spirituality through this neuropsychology reality. So, to be brief, what is more important to me here is to describe how the methodologies of and medical device used in this medical research also operates as an essential mediator that enacts spirituality in a very specific ways. Another point, <clears throat> spirituality or religion is not an abstract concept, but a cognitive uh, thought represented by materiality. So I was also wondering how spirituality became material on the medical field. As we know, according to the material religion approach, spirituality or religion is, are their material form. In my research, 
one interesting way to explore this idea is considering that materialized spirituality or religion is also a methodological exigence in the field, medical field. So the, the, the physicians, the medicals, they need to materialize spirituality to show that spirituality is something, is a thing, actually. Since they need to capture spirituality or religion as a clinical and measurable entity. So I'm considering, I, I was, I explore actually on my book and my, my, my reflections, this kind of just a position, no? Um, our reflection from the material religion and the needs of materialized spirituality and religion from the medical perspective. So in this first phase of my research, I did field work on the labs with the medical researchers. This is just one article that I put here, published in Nature, about spirituality on the brain, and this very exotic figure, the, this monk uh, with the electrodes on, in his brain. Um, <clears throat> So the first phase of the research was this. Uh, the second phase was how this kind of research generate clinical producers in hospitals. So I did field work in Brazil at one of the largest hospitals in Latin America, Hospital das Clinicas from the University of Sao Paulo. And they just, this is a public hospital, they just established an ambulatory of spirituality, which promotes uh, some complementary and alternative therapies, but also they, they do something that they call uh, spiritual anamnesis. And this is, uh, this is spread on the word, spiritual anamnesis. This is a, uh, uh, it's already a protocol in psychiatry that they use to measure spirituality and to use this kind of measurement um, uh, on the treatment. So the, on the second phase, I did a lot of field work on the, uh, on the hospital. So just seeing, trying to see how this reference from the, the, the lab, medical laboratories uh, became important also on the general and ordinary treatments. So the first one was the labs, then prescribing spirituality, and then, and I would like to, to talk a, a little bit more about that, was uh, how the research, research politics and spirituality, health politics. So my question here is, was, uh, how has the category of spirituality been enacted in official health policies around the world? I have spent a few years as, uh, as research at the Utrecht University, working with Birgit in Netherlands, and I did a lot of field work on the archives of the World Health Organization in Switzerland. What I did was I went to the archives and trying to find it, tried to track the word spirituality on the health documents. Uh, I, I have found more than 2000 documents that somehow deal with the idea of spirituality at the World Health Organization. So here I can only suggest that the, the most important events that mark the timeline of this category life in that institution. In institution. Uh, this is, I, I, I deeply reflect about that on the book and it's also published in some articles. So I, I would like just to point out some, some important arguments here. So surprisingly for me at least, I found that the discussion about spirituality start on the World Health Organization in 1948, only six months after the creation of the organization. Of course, during the last seven decades, the meaning of spirituality has changed a lot. 
if we navigate through those documents, we will recognize different ways of enacting the term. For example, so this, the, this is the first debate about spirituality. And so when you, you read the documents, you find spirituality as a dimension of health, spirituality as a value, spirituality as a right, spirituality related to traditional medicine, or as a dimension of well-being. Before explaining a bit more about uh, the life of the category spirituality in the WHO, I would like to synthesize my main argument here. And the idea, the idea is that the change in the meaning of spirituality on, to the world health on the World Health Organization are based on a more general transformation in which spirituality is no longer associated to culture, but instead is universalized as a human characteristic. In other words, we are talking about a change from spirituality of others to spirituality of all. So this is my main argument on the book, actually, because what I found is the ways that the medical field, the next day of spirituality is, is very related to this kind of universalization. And to universalize, you have two arguments that spirituality is spread on the, on the brain of whole humans. And what uh, the World Health Organization did is exactly the same. What I, I would like to show now is how step by step, the word, the, when you look at the document of the World Health Organization, you see how it's firstly attached to culture and then attached to nature. Uh, from this, this idea of spirituality of others to spirituality of all. Uh, I should explore that idea in different ways through the documents, but I will do some based uh, in, a, in a very specific case, case, the creation of the notion of the creation of the notion of traditional medicines. So for me, it's when you look at the, the creation of this notion, you can see this, this whole process. In 2008, the World Health Organization organized the International Conference on Primary Health Care and defined for the first time what is traditional medicine. The term was the sum of knowledge, skill, and practices based on theories, beliefs, and native experience of different cultures, whether empirical or not, used or maintaining health as well as in pre prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of physical, spiritual, and mental illness. So spiritual is already here. In a more recent document, traditional medicine is present in the follow following way. Throughout history, Asians, Africans, Arabs, Native America, Oceans, uh, Central America, South Americans, and other cultures, just they, they have cultures, uh, and other cultures have de developed the wide uh, variety of traditional native systems. Traditional medicine can be codified, regulated, taught, and practice, practiced uh, both openly, openly and systematically while further benef benefiting from thousands of years of, of experience. So, According to the World Health Organization, the experience and practice that the category of, of traditional medicine describe have uh, as their characteristic the presumption of attachment to cultural system, a non-Western origin, and a distance from the biomedical language. Founded in culture, historically located in a distant past, geographically distant from the West, 
and sensible to recognize native spirituality as a health system, the legitimacy of, spirit, of traditional medicines was based on another institutional experience. So now we have to do, to do a step back. Five years before the World Health Organization uh, created the idea of traditional medicine, they did a partnership with the Christian Medical Commission, an initiative of World Council of Churches. Unfortunately, I don't have time here to explore in the term in details the terms of this partnership, but it's important to clarify three points. The Christian Medical Commission was responsible for recognizing a huge complex of religious hospital in the global south. In doing that, they started a new strategy, concentrate less on central hospitals and investing in alliances with the local in the countryside, specifically with the native healers. So for, for, for them, it was a strategy. We need to, to do some partnerships and alliance with the native healers. The Christian Medical Commission did it. This alliance also reflects an important change in missionary strategy from the intention of general conversions to a holistic and ecumenic approach. And the second point, the, the third point important here is, as a medical missionary said, these new alliances, uh, the local healers have become a key, a, a, a key person to the effectiveness of the treatment. Only they could carry out the specific care practices that are culturally uh, compatible with their uh, group notion of body, body and especially with spirit. So, this is not a very uh, a trivial process, but the most important point for this presentation is that the Christian Medical Commission experience was the basis to the World Health Organization formulate the notion of traditional medicine. That includes, for the first time, the idea that spirituality is a health dimension. So far, I have argue, argued that first, the World Health Organization uh, enacts spirituality as a need of specific groups in which health and spirituality are supposedly intrinsic. So this was the first phase, the spirituality of the others. However, the World Health Organization started, on the, especially on the 70s and 80s, a series of medical research studies in the following years on non-Western medicines. This was a key process to reframe some traditional medicine and present them as recommended health practices beyond any cultural specificity. And uh, Yoga is a very magic case. So yoga play a very important role in this in this topic. Because of what yoga was, the, the argument is, yoga was the way that World Health Organization changed the idea that tradi some traditional medicines are specifically addressed to specific groups and start to use some practices such as yoga, as a recommendation for everyone. And when they did it, they kind of attached this first idea of spirituality and traditional medicines. And we start to see on the World Health Organization documents, the idea of spirituality also going to the recommend general recommendations. So the juxtaposition of two uh, of two 
World Health Organization documents is quite illustrative. The first one, entitled Traditional Medicine in Asia, published in 2002, described yoga as, uh, this is an official document, a spiritual journal, journey. Yoga is a develop, developmental practice for spiritual evolution, but one but but one can easily be used for disease relief. In the second document, uh, which focuses on the theme of mental well-being, the practices continue to be described in terms of its power to increase the spiritual dimension. However, this benefit is not territorialized in the scope of traditional medicine, but rather in the field of science, from practice from which practice it's deculturalized and becomes recommended as a technique for prevention, care, and well-being. This is correct. There is currently scientific validated validated evidence at various uh, at various levels from case so I, I I would like to to show the document just one minute this is exactly what say the document so the document is use this very scientific language to promote spiritual uh, to promote yoga and say that yoga is also related with spirituality which is also important for health so as as uh, i recognize this as one of the first movements toward uh, enacting spirituality of all i should stop here but uh it is following this process that we can understand how that how in May of 1984, during the General Assembly of the World Health Organization, published published the following res resolution. So this is the resolution. Having considered the report from the board the directors of the World Health Organization regarding the spiritual dimension for the program Health for All by the year of 2000, and further accompanying the recommendations of executive committee regarding resolution, da, 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 the assembly recognized that the spiritual dimension plays a great whole role in mot motivating people achievement in all aspects of life. It affirms that this dimension has not only stimulated worldwide action for health, but have, has also given to health as defined in the WHO constitution and added a spiritual dimension. So this is the most important document because actually it adds the spiritual dimension as a dimension of health to the WHO and invite member states to consider, to consider, including in their strategies for health, for all, a spiritual dimension as defined in, the, in this resolution by their social and cultural patterns. So this is part of uh, an effort to recognize the relationship between spirituality and health in a very secular context. So that's my movement. Uh, and I also would like to highlight uh, one thing that it's important uh, for me. <clears throat> when we talk about spirituality on the anthropology and social science, it's very common in usual to associate it with new age, and esoteric and non-institutionalized institutions or groups. My whole argument here is that spirituality is a very important category. It has a very long history and plays a very important political role. And it is greatly institutionalized also. So this is important. Uh, 
from our perspective. It's an approach that allows us to think about the politics of spirituality and their effects. As a category, I mean, uh, spirituality received uh, no, ha have not received yet a systematic genealogical treatment. And I'm trying to, to address in those questions because when you think about secularism, secular and religion, we have worked a lot on this category, but spirituality is still like uh, uh, a category that that is like a, a white white card uh, it, uh, is a, a category without history, without bodies, without uh, uh, history, without politics. So I try to through through the following the the this category on the medical field, on the labs, on the clinics, and also on the politics. Uh, find how this category has been universalized universalized by the by these these institutions so uh thank you this is a kickoff I'm, I'm trying to show you a very large uh, research this research was supported by a brazilian agents and involved more than 20 students from uh, undergrad to phd so it's huge and i'm very happy to say that we finished it last year and the book is launched so i'm gonna show you i'm gonna send to you the the link and you can download it in, in spanish version yeah perfect thank you rodrigo um, and congratulations for finishing this um, amazing research very robust empirically and document to be and um, yeah, um, we we are very um, also excited to hear now from um, the participants, the attendants um, of this webinar. If you've got any questions, any insights um, with regards to Rodrigo's presentation, um, let me check also the chat. I. I will start, just a moment, I can't see the, oh, Ma, we've got Ma here. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. I think that uh, your research is fascinating also because you show, uh, you really show what many of us had an impression of these links between medicine and spirituality and how this become institutionalized, but but your work really shows it and, and, and the three stages really, that that you organize your presentation are really clear no? and my my question is can you or are you able to to explain or to to describe and to explain differences in the impact that this policy by the WTO has had in 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 different areas of the world so uh what have been the impact in Europe but also in, in Latin America but maybe in Asia so how how this different the different countries navigate this uh, this policy and my second question is it is possible to identify kind of uh, main policy entrepreneurs of this approach because you talk a lot about uh, medical uh, field and how doctors have been clear key agents there. But I was thinking, for instance, in the uh, Ministry of Yoga in India, or for instance, some of these uh, Buddhist organizations that are in the US and try to promote meditation. So it is possible to kind of map who are the main entrepreneurs in this kind of approach? And in a way, who, who is winning from uh, this type of uh, policy being gaining uh, ground in the world? So I, I don't know if it's clear. I'm a bit tired today. So maybe Yeah, that's great, Mar. Uh, so this this was fascinating, actually. Uh, I, I, I have to say, of course, we can see the... the 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 consequence of this policy in, in things like yoga in prison, yoga in, in, in schools and that stuff, this is important, this is an, an important uh, X. But I would like to, to highlight two others. The, the first one is 
palliative care. And palliative care is something that I think we should research more because it's like the gray zone of the medicine. And it is there where spirituality is start to play a very important role and step by step is going like deeply to the center of the debate of medicines and, and the, the, the medical care through this margin. So palliative care, it's important. But in Brazil and Latin America, and my, my colleague uh, Olga Rogers in, in Mexico has worked with it, um, the effects of the policies of spirituality also authorize the evangelical groups to work with the therapeutic communities. Uh, is, is that the name in English? Therapeutic communities? Uh, comunidades terapeuticas? I mean, uh, is where you treat people with drugs problems. And in Brazil and in Mexico, the government like pay some some groups to do it so to care this this process in brazil specifically who do it are the evangelical groups and they do it using the argument that spirituality is very important as recognized by the world health organization and as proved by the scientific field uh, as a starting point to get uh, the addiction treatment. So it's a very complex perspective and it's a very complex uh, phenomenon that put together evangelical, the idea of spirituality in this kind of argument. So I would say that in Brazil, uh, usually the, 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 the policy of spirituality are addressed to this therapeutic community and of course also to some uh, uh, native Brazilian treatments that allow them to use through the idea of spirituality treatments uh, non-Western in hospitals. For example, call a, a shaman or something to the hospital. But, but generally, uh, the, the process of therapeutic community is important. And in other parts of the world, uh, the argument of spirituality as a health dimension also allows the countries to start public policies about uh, complementary alternative therapies. So they introduce complementary and alternative therapies in uh, public health systems, arguing that this is a way to care the uh, spiritual dimension. So Spirituality as a politics is a is a, a open gate to do a lot of things, actually, and it's 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 fascinating to follow it. But of course, it's also a bit scary. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I will use my power as a moderator to pose the question, just because it's connected to what you just mentioned. Um, so throughout uh, your your research, this project, um, you, you explained how you uh, saw this connection between spirituality and health, particularly evolved throughout these international institutions. But there's also another word that is very present when we think about health, which is well-being. And uh, we've got uh, our colleague um, Anna Halafov in Australia working with well-being. And um, I'm very interested to know from, from you if across throughout your field work, um, how did you see this word, or this word came, came up alongside health or if it's a different pro, uh, process or if there's any meaning in your research? That's amazing, Rafael, because this is another, if, if I should, if I, I, start a new research now, I, I would like to go deeply on the category of well-being. Because this is another white card on the World Health Organization, on the medical stuff. 
So I, I invite you, go to the PubMed, which is the 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 largest where the, the the medical researchers publish their journals and put well-being and put it in in the graph uh, looking at the 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 time the the, the time lapse of of this you know, the time history it's impressive so since the 80s the discussion about well-being is huge but at the same time well-being is nothing so this is this is this play uh, 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 in a very uh, approximative way that spirituality plays because it can be everything it can be yoga in prison it can be uh, meditation in schools it also can be treatments for drug drug the people with pro drug problems so and well-being, it's it's a it's a fascinating category. I have not following it, but I saw a lot. This category uh, start to be attached with whole discussions about mental health and spirituality on the world health organization. So, if someone started, please let me know. I would like to to hear more about it. This is a it's a, an amazing PhD dissertation to do. Arena, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, I think this this uh, terrain of the 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 encounter between science and medicine and spirituality is something that uh, we need we need to get into that field, and it's difficult because they seem to operate in completely different parameters. But I'm um, <clears throat> I was. I'm actually uh, curious about an experience that I got to know in in um, <clears throat> in Brazil, in 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 a ho in spiritual hospital, and I can't remember exactly the name of this organization. In um, yeah, and and so the that was like the other ex extreme, let's say, a, a, a spiritual hospital where interventions are done by spirits and in 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 um, in theaters and people go and get hospitalized to be treated and then discharged does it also come into this encounter and this seems to have a long time of, of that has been operating for it, it seems to me a quite established institution so how this how how that what what role does it play that, those kind of experiences if you can tell it amazing lorena thank you um in brazil we have a lot of this kind of uh, spiritual hospitals the most famous is the john of god uh, uh christina rocha who also presents here oh gonna present here will present here right sure um, well, Anna. yeah published a book, amazing book about John of God. And Oprah have been there, has been there. So it's, it's a like world famous. But for my medicals, for my researchers, this is other stuff. This is uh, nothing related. So they are, it's, it's very curious because these, these doctors and researchers, they are, how to say that? They are they try to be more scientific than the science. Más papista que el papa, porque uh, 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 because it, it's necessary for them to prove that what they are doing it's very standard, it's very gold parameter. So they are they they try not to associate with nothing related to to religion or that stuff. And I would like also to 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 this, to highlight one point here that they use the word spirituality or spiritual and not religion, of course, because this is important to they use this white card. So it's important they change the, the word. No, it's, uh, it, it's, I mean, it, it's important to them. So they, they try to say spirituality has nothing to do with religion, so we are not related with it. Thank 
got here one question in the chat by Geraldine Moussier. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, so, thank you, Rodrigo. Um, you mentioned the presence of spiritual producers in the biomedical field, which I find really interesting. Can you say more about these spiritual producers? And she apologizes for being in a public space. Thank you, Geraldine. Geraldine, so good to not see you, but to, to be with you here. Um, I, I was referring uh, to a, another another to a very interesting uh, uh, new profession, which is spiritual care. Have you heard about it? Spiritual care they are they are kind of uh, replacing the, the 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 chaplaincy and the people that work in chaplaincy. So they are health pro uh, professionals of health that are being uh, trained as experts on the spirit and this ambulatory of spirituality just employ spiritual cares that are trained in your country in canada so they travel from brazil to canada to be this to, to get this kind of expertise of course, we can read it and, and think about it as a medical process of incorporate every aspect of our life as a medical issue. I mean, this is just Foucault working, no? Uh, and it's interesting because now the, the medicals and this kind of spiritual care are also that usually are related with chaplaincy and that stuff so now it's the profession of spiritual spiritual care this is very interesting so i was relate referring to spiritual care which i know that you you know a lot and we follow here and we i i, I follow the creation of this ambulatory of spirituality which was a very interesting experience and I uh, yeah this is deeply described on the book so this is a very ethnographic case it's a very specific and long history uh, perspective a lot of field work I did it I, I did on that yeah this is important Geraldine because this is important um because usually they 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 affirm that there is a positive correlation between spirituality and health. If you are more spiritualized, you get less chance to have a heart attack. But sometimes spirituality also can be bad. And this is important for them. For example, when you are dying and you are very religious people, person, and very spiritualized, you can start to be very afraid of the death. And it, it, and, and it, it can be very bad for your health and your whole process of death. So they create a lot of indicators of the bad spirituality and the good spirituality, the uh, positive coping and the negative coping of spirituality. So this ambulatory of spirituality also deal with it. They try to uh, guide the spirituality for the good way, uh, to the good way. So, yeah, somehow they there is this pathologization of spirituality. But I also would like to to uh, to comment here that I. I have, I has, uh, I had uh, uh, a student in Brazil that did a dissertation about uh, the the diagnosis of religions and the spiritual problems, and this is a a diagnosis on the DSM. You no, know? Pedro Issa also is my student, and he is working with that stuff, some some stuff related. So. Some, uh, we, we also try to find this kind of 
pathologization and also how spiritual, spirituality became a protocol and how it became important on the psychiatry to produce diagnosis. So, the, yeah, I, I agree. Just just saying that they, they try to intervene the whole time. Rodrigo, we've got here um, Xavier Jimeno, uh, who uh, also posed a question on the chat. He frames that he, uh, uh, he understands that your uh, focus is on the relationship between medicine and spirituality. And his question is, uh, if you see greater connections between medicine and spirituality in the lower classes than in the upper classes. That's, uh, thank you, Xavier. Uh, in Brazil, the phenomenon of the Pentecostalization, uh, it's, as you may know, a, a great process. I mean, it's a, it's a huge process. And it's uh, situated more on the lower classes. And this is interesting because uh, we find some, some, uh, some situations that the patients say, no, I don't would like to talk about spirituality with you, spiritual care of the hospital, with you, doctor, with you, psychiatrist, because I am a religious, I am a religious person. And who say that usually are the evangelicals, which are uh, lower class in Brazil. So it's interesting because the refuse of spirituality is, is the contrary of the, the, our perspective or, or some uh, common sense can, can, can imagine. Because the, the lower class usually in Brazil refuse this idea. And yeah. So that, that's my comment. I mean, uh, the, the evangelicals plays, it's like a double bind, a Batesonian double, double bind, because somehow the evangelicals benefit and create the therapeutic communities to treat uh, uh, persons, with, people with drug problems through the spirituality. And at the same time, they also use, when they see spirituality on the hospital, they refuse it, which just show up how this category is everything and nothing at the same time. Perfect. Any last questions or? Got Bancole Falade here mentioning that appears to be a strong link worldwide between spirituality, religious beliefs, economy and health. Um, yeah, yeah, just agree, and yeah. Great. Um, well, uh, thank you again, Rodrigo, uh, for your um, presentation. It was really, really um, interesting. And um, on a note also that we hope to see you on our following um, webinar um, on the 30th of April, precisely with Geraldine Mosier and Pro Bamadat. Uh, on spiritual coaching and holistic practices in Canada. So I think it will be um, somehow very linked to your presentation here and we can explore more of this field. Thank you again, everyone, and see you uh, on the 30th.